So we just looked at inverse transformations and I said they were inverse matrices. So we'll play around with a little notation here and inverses. So I've been talking about transformations and matrices. They're basically the same thing. Uh, a transformation is represented by a matrix. So, well, linear transformations are represented by matrices. So usually I'll use the letter T for a transformation and then T is going to go from some M dimensional space to N dimensional space and <clears throat> we looked at the uh, matrix, the, the dimensions of the matrix that would represent this right here. So I'll do that one more time. Um, so we're going to suppose the A represents so this is an A is a matrix that represents T and we're going to find the dimensions of A. So I'm going to write it as A and now our input is M dimensional. So we got M rows, one column, our output just reading off of M and N right here. So that's off the dimensions of our domain dimensions of our range. So we're multiplying by an M uh, vector and then we're going to get an N, oops, N by one vector here. All right, so write down the dimensions A has to have in order for this product to work out. So A is going to be an N by M matrix. So you got to get your M, your internal dimensions to match, and then your external dimensions are your dimension of your product. So A is an N by M matrix. Now, <clears throat> the way I've been writing our uh, correspondence, I wrote T with a little A like this. Um, and that's just the transformation with the matrix A uh, sort of bundled together. So this means really just left multiply by A. So now we're going to look at inverses and inverse notation here. So I can look at the inverse like this. So that would be the inverse transformation. And that's the same as the transformation that is associated with the inverse matrix of A. So that notation right there is how inverses would work here. So the opposite or the inverse transformation uh, of TA would be the transformation associated with A inverse. So that is how inverse notation works with this. So I think we found enough inverses already that I don't need to find an inverse of a transformation right now. Or do you want to see an example? I don't really have one prepared, so I'll have to make up a matrix and then hope it's invertible. And most likely, we'll have fractions all over the place if it is invertible. Uh, so I don't want to just make one up on the fly. But you've inverted matrices before. Let's just really quickly review how to invert ma a matrix. So first of all, your dimensions have to be uh, M or square matrix. So it's got to be an N by N matrix, usually over the real numbers. All right, before we even try to invert, how would we know it's possible? Take the determinant. Take the determinant. And what property of that determinant would we be looking for? So it's either zero or not, and then the only numbers or only determinants that 
or I always think of real numbers, zero does not have a multiplicative inverse. So the zero determinant means you don't have a multiplicative inverse on your matrix. Um, so first, A inverse exists exactly when determinant A not zero. So now to f actually invert So we're going to do an augmented matrix A with the identity. Now this identity will have to be the right dimensions, which are n by n. You're going to do row operations, hopefully not too many. And then you're going to get down to identity on the left, which is generally your goal anyways. And what you're left over on the right will be A inverse. So that is how we invert the matrix A. And of course, algebraically, algebraic properties, A times A inverse is I, IN specifically, and then A inverse A, it doesn't matter the order. Uh, so you can commute matrices if you know they're inverses of each other. It's a little silly to commute inverses because you can also cancel them out to the identity. So I don't know why. You, there may be some weird situation where you'd want to commute inverse matrices, but most of the time you'd want to cancel them to the identity, usually. All right, so that's the end of linear transformations. Well, you know it's never the end of anything in math, but that's the end of them for now. Uh, we're going to go on to the next section, which of course we'll use transformations at different points. So our next section is going to be Markov chains. I don't know why they won't let me title it. Oh well. So Markov chains. So what we're going to do is start out with an example here. So instead of defining anything, let's just start with an example. So we'll you do a toothpaste example. Most of us use toothpaste, so it's relatable. Uh, so a sample of 200 people. Uh, I'll use toothpaste. Uh, of two brands. Now that last part is not very realistic. We have more than two brands, but well, maybe there's only two brands. I don't know, consolidation, market consolidation, all that stuff. I'm not sure, but let's just pretend there's two brands to make this problem more simple. Uh, and we'll call the two brands A and B. All right, in one month, so in one month of those using brand A, Seventy percent continue to use A. And thirty percent uh, switch to B. So that is of the people using brand A, seventy percent continue, thirty percent switch. In one month of those using B, uh, we have an 80 20. So 80% continue to use B and 20% switch. 
function a. All right, so we're going to draw up a little system here of people who are using A and using B, and then how many, basically it's gonna be a flow diagram. It's gonna show how things change in one month. So we'll do the A users on the left, the B users on the right. And so I'm just reading what's on the screen now. Of those using B, 80% continue to use B. So I'm gonna draw one arrow. And that's going to be 80%. So 80% is annoying to write. So I'm going to write 0.8. That requires a lot less ink. So that'll be 0.8 is going to uh, continue to use B. And then we have that 20% that's going to go back to A. So now if I look back up of those who are using A, 70% continue to use A. So A has a loop back to itself with 0.7 and then there's a arrow over to B with a 0.3. So this just shows how things are going to change in a month right here. So initially 120 people use A, and then of course 80 people use B. All right, so a relatively easy question to ask is after one month, what are the numbers going to be? And I'm gonna have you answer that. So after one month, month find A users and B users. If you really need a calculator you can do that. No shame. We got numbers here. Decimals in fact. All right so find the A user and the B users. And just from glancing at this more people are switching from A to B than are switching from B to A. So intuitively, I would expect there to be uh, more using B at the end and slightly less using A at the end, just because of that flow in between. So more people are going to B. Oh, it was seven times 12. 84. 84. Oh, was this using A or B? Yeah, this is using A. And then the other one will be the, let's see. So I'm using XA as uh, users of A, and then XB as users of B. OK, 
Okay. So any questions on these? You may have done it more um, arithmetically by just hitting keys on your calculator. I want to warn you against doing that because it's very unlikely you remember the sequence of keys you hit and what that really meant. Whereas right here, we're actually going to be creating linear equations, which is a good idea in linear algebra class. All right, so this is just one month right here. Now I want you to compute after two months. So this is a situation after one month, so I want you to go one more month in the future. And what's gonna happen next month? And so you're gonna use the 100 and 100 now because there's, that's what our users are after one month, our 100 and 100. So you should have 90 using A and then 110 using B. And again, this should match your intuition. Over time, A should be losing a little and B should be gaining a little. Now, if you saw the first time around, the difference was basically 20 and then this time difference was 10. <coughs> so if we kept going, the difference, the amount of people changing is going to keep decreasing. So the idea is at some point, it's going to almost be zero. It's going to get close to zero people changing after some point. So let's solve this in a linear algebra way. So let's just look at the uh, initial product or the initial linear combinations at the top. So we'll just examine that down here. I'm going to lay out the dimensions of these matrices. So we're going to have a 2 by 1 and a 2 by 1. And what I'm just looking at is basically our output is a two-dimensional vector right here. Now, the other part is a little tricky to see because it's happening where I'm circling right here. So what I'm going to do is just put 120 and 80. And I'll just say, because I said so now, it will make sense in a minute. Um, and of course, get 100 and 100 over here. What matrix, well, I need a two by two in order for the dimensions to work out. What two by two matrix goes here? So let's try the easy, what looks like might work is let's just grab those coefficients that I didn't circle and throw them in here. And we're going to go across and down. So I'll draw my light green across, uh, across and down. And if you look, we do get 0.7 times 120 plus 0.2 times 80. So what we just did is rewrote our linear system in a way that's more familiar as a matrix product. Okay, let's think about the, uh, so this is the one month situation. So let's look at now the two month situation written out like this. The only difference is our initial condition is not 120, 80. Our initial condition is 100, 100 now. 
So I'm going to swap out that 12080 and put the 100 100 in. And we still want to multiply by the same coefficient matrix. I'll look back up those 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.8. That's exactly the same. So those are not changing our other coefficients. So that two by two matrix is going to remain unchanged. We got 9110. I'm going to combine these two together uh, where I'm going to replace this 100, 100 by the product above. So it's equal. So I'm going to replace that 100, 100 vector by the product that I put a box around above. So this is still the two months. So we have our 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.8. And then another, and I'm being lazy and writing my uh, matrices with parentheses, not square brackets. So only because I don't feel like making square brackets. But feel free, if you want your matrices to be square, make them square. So any questions on what we did right there? It was really just a substitution, that's all. All right, now I'm going to reassociate. We've got the same matrix here multiplied twice, so we got it squared. So that's algebraically really easy to see. 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0.8 squared, 120, 80 equals 90, 110. All right, so this is our two-month equation. Can you get the one month equation by modifying this? Mm -hmm. What would we do to get the one month equation? Lower the power. Drop the power to one. What if I want three months? Go to three. What if I want 100 months? Go to 100. All right, so we'll write the n, uh, the n month equation. Of course, if I don't know n, I don't know what to write on the other side. So what I'm going to do, let's go I'll just write a n b n. That'll be the a. So a n is the a users um, after n months. And then b n will be the b users And months or months, whatever. So if we look in our uh, coefficient matrix. So we'll give it a name. I've already used A and B, so we'll just call it C. So our coefficient matrix is this 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0.8. Uh, so <clears throat> this is a, uh, if we look at the columns, so the columns uh, form probability vectors. So we look at that first column right there, 0 0.7, 0 0.3. That was 70% uh, are going to stay, and 30% are going to leave brand A. So that was a probability on brand A. 
And then our second column was basically brand B. How many people are going to stay in brand B? How many people are going to leave brand B? So those are what we call probability vectors. So what is a probability vector, the definition? So we haven't done this operation before, but a probability vector So it could be any dimension. So this one will be n-dimensional. So ours just happen to be two-dimensional. It is a, a vector like this such that all of these vi's are between 0 and 1. So they're all a percentage between 0% and 100%, or a decimal number between 0 and 1. So I'm I'm not a big fan of using percentages. I just like to, if I want 90%, I just use 0.9. So each of these are numbers between 0 and 1. And if we add them all up, so that summation of VI, you get 100% or 1. So individually, all the probabilities are between 0 and 100%. And then you add up all the probabilities, you should get exactly 100%. So that's what a probability vector is. So all the values will be small positive numbers that add up to 1. Technically, you could drop this requirement right here, that individually they have to be less than 1. What happens if you get one of these, let's say V2 is greater than 1? Other ones would have to be negative to add up to 1. So if you have one that's bigger than 1, you're going to have to have negatives to compensate. So. But I'll just leave that condition in that was here a second ago. So if you have a matrix whose columns are probability vectors, we call that a stochastic matrix. So a matrix whose columns are probability vectors. Uh, it is called a stochastic T-O-C-H-A-S-T-I-C. And we have the uh, formula, or the equation, x the xn equals a n x. We'll write x is 0 there. So if you multiply your stochastic matrix on the left by x, your current, whatever your current uh, situation is, you'll get the next step. So we were counting in months before. So if we just multiply by a, times our current numbers, we'll get next month's numbers. A squared will look two months in the future. You technically, if A is invertible, you could look backwards as well with negative powers. You just invert it. <coughs> so of course, what we're going to do is look at the infinite case. No reason to keep it easy. Let's go to infinity. So I know there's some of you who have not taken calculus before. I'm pretty sure this is the only topic that we cover that uses calculus, um, but we'll get through it. So what happens when n approaches infinity? So this arrow right here just means approaches. So this is n approaches. Infinity. Now, if you haven't taken calculus, in, well, even if you have taken and passed calculus, like I have, infinity is still a hard thing to understand. So let's talk about infinity for a minute. I'm going to draw a number line. So this is all real numbers. What is the thing bigger than all real numbers? Infinity. 
So the right endpoint is infinity. What's the thing smaller than all the numbers? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. So think of these like fence posts or it's like limits of all the numbers. Now the reason it's hard to think of is because we always deal in finite quantities. We don't have any concept really of infinity. Even if you count all the atoms in the universe, however big that is, it will be a number. Huge number, but a number. Uh, so without getting too philosophical, these are basically what bounds all numbers. Numbers don't really have bounds, so it's very hard to understand. Uh, a good example, so one of our problems is we don't, one of the things we don't live forever. So when we say the word forever, we mean maybe 80 years if you're lucky. Somebody says, I love you forever. 80 years, probably about the max you can expect. <laughs> unless, they're, unless you're both like four years old, then maybe you're, you can expect 90 years if you're both very lucky. But my point is, Infinity does not really exist in life, which is why it's very hard to think about something that you cannot at all relate to. All right, so infinity is the thing bigger than all the numbers, and negative infinity is the thing that's smaller than all the numbers. So now we're going to think about n approaching infinity. Well, it's never going to get there, so it's theoretical. So what would happen if n could approach infinity? So that's what calculus is all about, is looking at what would happen if you could actually approach infinity. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a limit. So I'm taking the limit of that entire equation that is right there at the top of the screen. So that's one way to look at this, take a limit. So we're looking, there's two, two ways to consider this. So one is take a limit. There's a second way we can do this. Is there a vector x such that ax equals x? So is there a vector <coughs> such that when you multiply by a, it doesn't change? So if, if there was a vector such that ax equals x, what would a squared x be? a squared would be x, a cubed, or a squared times x would be x, a cubed times x would be x. You basically can pick one a off at a time. So multiply as many a's as you want, you're going to get right back to x. Uh, so we call the, uh, this vector x is called the equilibrium state. And a n to the x equals x, so x is called the equilibrium state. So it's the, if we think back to the toothpaste example, if we could look infinite number of years in the future where, of course it's silly because People aren't going to be around infinitely long, so we won't always have 200 people who are always the same going into the future. So again, this is much more theoretical. Uh, but if the same 200 people use toothpaste forever and those brands existed forever, we would be finding the distribution that would occur at a time that would never exist. All right, so let's do it. I'm just going to look at this AX equals X again. That's if we can solve this ax equals x for x, then uh, we found our equilibrium state. All right, how in the world can we solve for x? It's in two places. 
How do I get X on one side? We want to get X on one side with no friends. How do I get X on one side? Subtract? I like that. There's no inverse for a vector, so I can't multiply by the inverse of X. That doesn't make sense. You can't multiply vectors anyways, so there's, that's not an option. So all we have is subtraction. We're adding a negative. All right. Now I'm going to do something illegal, and you hopefully will correct this. So that doesn't make any sense. What is a matrix A minus a number? Undefined. What goes there that acts like one? Identity. identity. So I'm going to go back and put a little identity multiple in front of x. We know that multiplying by the identity is not going to change anything. So I can put that coefficient matrix up there. And now a minus i is just fine. And now we solve for x. And what we're looking at is, this is the same as null space of a minus i. That's all we're going to find. So that is a problem we have solved before many times. So let's see if we're going to, I'm going to write that a matrix that we were working with before. We're going to see if we can find the null space of that a minus identity. Unfortunately, there's going to be some decimals hanging around, but let's see if we can get through it. So our example, our A was 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.8, 0 0.2. So I'm going to find null A minus I. All right, so I'll give you a three minute head start and then I'll begin. Hmm? The point eight and the point two were switched. And the, what we had. Oh. Yes. Yeah. This A is the second column is reversed. That'd be really bad for brand B if eighty percent <laughs> left. <laughs>
All right, so I got two thirds and one. Now any, well, any scalar multiple of this will work. So I'll just put an alpha next to it. So any scalar multiple of this will work. So if our entire world was one and two thirds people, two thirds of the person would be using brand A and one person would be using B. So let's scale this up. I think A should be at least three. That'll give me a nicer mix, right? There. Or alpha should be three. So if alpha is three, uh, we would get two, three. So if there's five people, two of them would use A, three of them would use B. If we scale this all the way up, I'm not good with numbers, but we could scale this way higher. We're going to need to multiply this by to hit 240. 40 maybe. So that's 80, 120. So our original population of 200 toothpaste users, 80 would be using A and 120 would be using B. And this would be what we call this equilibrium or the stable condition. So eventually you would expect this ratio right here of people. Uh, now, any of these vectors right here tell you the same information, so you can use any of them. I don't like fractions, so I, I really didn't like the first one I got. So again, we're basically just defining a span right here, and you're picking any multiple that's not zero. So the first one I got was just the standard, you get ugly coefficients, multiply by whatever denominator, gives you no more fractions. Uh, so normally I would just go with two and three, but I wanted to get back to our 200 people. So I went all the way, scaled it way up to 8120.